Our goal today is to try to educate you and to give you the facts that you need about Ebola. Um, one thing about this situation that it is changing on a daily basis, um, as I updated my slides this afternoon right before I came with the latest information. Um, so what I would like to do first is not just give myself a selfless plug for Twitter. Um, <laughs> if you are looking for Ebola information, I actually try to update my webpage with information on the latest update. So I actually have a Twitter account for the college where I'm posting infectious disease information. So if you want to do a one-stop shopping on Ebola, it's a good place to go. The other thing that I want to share is actually a link to a PBS um, Nova episode that aired uh, about a month ago, and it actually is very timely. Let's see if this will open. If you want additional information from what I'm giving you today, this is actually a great place to go. And it's a good video. It's about 45 minutes long, and it will give you very up-to-date information, a good source if you have someone who couldn't come today and wanted additional info. So let's go forward. I found this slide uh, in the past week. It was published by NPR, so I'm not going to take credit for all of the statistics. But I thought it was a great summation of what our real risk is here in the United States. So we see in the news lots of information making us very concerned whether I need to be concerned about Ebola on a daily basis. So our top number, 1 in 13.3 million, that is your risk of getting Ebola in the United States if we have had 12 imported cases. At this point in time, we've had seven imported cases into the United States of Ebola. Notice you're actually more likely to get hit by lightning. Um, more likely to get um, killed by a shark attack if you're a water person. Uh, one in 9,000 chance of getting killed in a car accident. So I'm not trying to be morbid. I'm just trying to show you statistics of things that we know. And then lastly, the one that probably may come, um, really send home the risk more than anything. You have a one in 5,000 chance of being infected with Ebola if you were in, um, I'm sorry, Monrovia. So Monrovia is a coastal city in Liberia. And right now, they are um, reporting the highest case number on a weekly basis. So they have about 200 cases of Ebola per week. And we're finding about 1 in 500 chance of becoming infected. And that's a city of about 1 million. So let's start with what do we really know about Ebola. And what I want to talk about, and I will give you, so since, since I'm a microbiologist, you may think this is going to be all science. And I promise you there's two lines of science in here. And the rest is a lot of scientific fact that you may find interesting. So when we refer to Ebola, we think of either Ebola virus disease or Ebola hemorrhagic fever. And what we know is that Ebola is a virus that was first discovered in Zaire in 1976. And there's lots of different strains of the virus that have been circulating. And this particular outbreak is actually attributed to the Zaire strain. And originally, it was thought that this was isolated from um, non-human primates, so gorillas or apes. So my science, for my science students here, um, it's the family Filoviridae, uh, and it is a single-stranded RNA enveloped organism. So it's a long rod shaped, which you can see here. So this is our, our token. Um, Ebola picture. There's two or three of them that are circulating. This is um, electron microscopy. And these are done in black and white. They're colorized to make them look more interesting. Um, Ebola only has seven genes, so it's actually a rather small virus. And infections with this particular organism are associated with fatality rates that range from 50 to 90 percent. This particular outbreak, the, the fatality rate is running around 71 percent. So how do we actually become infected with this organism? We need to be exposed. And the organism needs to be able to enter our body. And it can do that in several different ways. If we have a cut or an abrasion that is open, an open wound, the organism can enter that way. Or it can enter into a mucous membrane, which is our mouth, our nose, or our eyes. When we ask the question, where is the virus hiding in nature, what researchers have actually found is that it actually hides in fruit bats. And there are two different particular ones that are problematic in Western Africa. So the hammerhead, which is this lovely gentleman hanging upside down, um, he almost kind of looks like a moose or a horse. Um, and then Franquette's epauletted bat is here. So these organisms are the nat these bats are the natural reservoir for the organism, which means they are colonized, they don't get sick. So how do we get from bat to human and to become ill? Um, and what we know is that in Western Africa, these bats are actually hunted by people for food. 
Um, the other thing we know is that if a bat defecates on your food, or if there is bat saliva contaminating food and it is not cleaned appropriately, when a human consumes that food, they actually will become infected. And that's usually how people are exposed, and that is the beginning of the outbreak. We know infected primates, such as apes and monkeys, can transmit the disease to humans. And we also know we can transmit the disease human to human, which is what's evident in this outbreak. Important things that we do know is that there is no evidence at all that dogs or cats can actually become infected with the organism or spread the organism to other animals. And there's also absolutely no evidence that this organism can be transmitted in mosquitoes or in any other insects, which we know diseases like malaria can actually be transmitted by mosquitoes. What we found, and what is a little bit unusual about this outbreak, is that if you look through history, most of the previous Ebola outbreaks have actually been in Central Africa, and this one is localized to Western Africa. So how did we get here? And there's lots of information on this slide, but what it does is it gives you a timeline. And what we know is that our index patient, our first patient that was reported ill, was tracked back to a two-year-old boy, um, and the animal source at this point in time has not actually been identified. The New England Journal of Medicine has posted a few articles about this original outbreak, and what they think has happened is that there's been um, several instances of bats transmitting organism to humans in this area over the last several months before this outbreak actually began. There are actual um, hospital records showing focal um, infections where they were eliminated and we didn't have um, an event where it was spread uncontrollably. So this young two-year-old boy who first became infected um, ended up infecting his family. Um, and it was in, um, and I'm not going to pronounce this uh, correctly, so I'm not even going to pronounce it and, and do it a disjustice. But it's a prefecture here, when a prefecture is kind of like a county or a district. Um, what happened, and that was the beginning of the outbreak, um, was in February, one of the healthcare workers that actually took care of one of this child's family members was infected. And that person traveled to three different prefectures and passed the virus on, and that was the beginning of the outbreak. So in February, this individual traveled, spread the virus to three separate areas, and then in March, of March 14th, um, the Guinea Ministry of Health um, became involved, and they contacted Doctors Without Borders, who have always been the primary caregivers to these individuals in um, Africa. When they showed up in mid-March, what they found is 111 cases with a 71% fatality rate. And one of the unusual things about this particular outbreak is that the virus is showing symptoms that were slightly different than previous Ebola outbreaks. So when people think of Ebola, they think of someone who's just bleeding and hemorrhaging from eyes, nose, mouth. That wasn't the case with this particular organism. The earlier cases were associated with vomiting, they were associated with fever, diarrhea, but no documented hemorrhage for most of the early patients. So we go from the end of March to August, which is when everyone was returning back to school, and I think a lot of the national um, panic about Ebola really began. So in August, the WHO declared a public health emergency of international concern. And at that point in time, people were really starting to pay attention to this incredible outbreak. What we know is that on September 14th, the WHO reported about 4,500 cases of confirmed Ebola illness. On Friday, they reported 10,100 cases of Ebola illness. So in about two months' time, we've doubled our numbers, and that's projected to continually increase. So why was this not controlled? Why is this outbreak such a huge crisis for the international community? And there are several things that have come up. Um, and the first one is, is an insufficient effort in uh, this area of Africa being completely unprepared for the infection. In order to control Ebola, what we know is that you need a very quick, a very rigorous response with control measures that we know work. And that includes contact tracing. So if a patient has become ill, who else have they come into contact with? And those individuals are usually watched very carefully or they're actually put into quarantine. Patient isolation. We put, them, we put individuals into wards or isolation units so you have limited exposure. And then the last thing that gets um, put into place is a change in the burial practices. So in this region um, of Africa, it is not uncommon that family members of the deceased actually wash the body and prepare for burial. 
One of the most common ways Ebola is transmitted from person to person is in that practice. So when an Ebola outbreak happens, doctors without borders usually stop that practice and then they, they'll, what they'll do is they'll take the deceased and they incinerate the bodies, which is a different practice than what the families usually do. So that's one big issue that has happened. The second issue that happens is poor healthcare infrastructure. Think of the last time that you had to go to the doctor. Think of the last time that you actually went to an emergency room. Of all the care, of the high-tech equipment, of all of the people that you came across that knew exactly what needed to be done to get you, to get you from a sick state, whether it was a broken arm or if it was a really bad cold, to a healthy state. Take all of that and throw it out the window. These countries are poor. They do not have the healthcare infrastructure we have. So the things that we take for granted or that we have access to, they do not have access to. First one, healthcare workers. Once the, this outbreak began, several things happened. One, many of them outright leave the area. They know what's coming. They have a lack of appropriate material to control the infection. And they have to make a life or death, life or death decision. It's them or their families. Many, many healthcare workers have died treating sick patients. And then a the last part of the healthcare scenario is that these individuals have not been paid at all. They need to support their family, so many of them have refused to go to work. It is not uncommon, and it has been reported by Doctors Without Borders, it's been reported by the MMWR, which is a publication by the CDC, and it's found in the New England Journal of Medicine. Many of these people who are providing primary care are volunteers. A lot of the times, they're nursing students. So they're not trained individuals. And to send home the lack of healthcare workers, in the United States, our ratio of physician to doctor is usually one doctor per 400 patients. In Liberia, on average, you have one doctor per 70,000 patients. Um, there's publications looking at the amount of physicians in different districts and what the MMWR published, again, a publication by the CDC, they found that half the physicians left the country when the outbreak began. So there were six physicians to take care of three counties Half of them left when the outbreak was documented and they realized what was going on. So then the last issue with, pub, um, one of the last issues with healthcare infrastructure is lack of isolation facilities. So think of an ICU here at a big hospital. All of the equipment that is in that ICU. What we know in Liberia, when we look at isolation facilities, they didn't have electricity. They didn't have running water. They didn't have waste disposal. And most importantly, and one of the biggest issues, and this has become an issue in this country, and I think really put Ebola in the forefront, was appropriate PPE. So personal protective equipment in, in the field of micro and in infection control, we refer to it as PPE. These individuals don't have gloves, they don't have gowns, they don't have bleach, they don't have alcohol, they don't have soap. So they're not able to even wash their hands to eliminate infection. That is a huge issue. We know it's easily killed by bleach and by alcohol. So if you had your questionnaire, that's your answer, bleach. Um, last thing is the location of this particular outbreak. Um, we know individuals very frequently travel between small villages and towns and big cities, facilitating spread of organism. So why was this not controlled? There's lots of aspects. Poor healthcare infrastructure is the biggest thing. But the most important take home message from this is that healthcare infrastructure is the problem. This is not a super virus. We see in the news right now about superbugs and how superbugs are gonna get us. This is not the issue with this particular organism. We can control infection and we can eliminate this infection with appropriate measures. And that's what's important to know. So what do we need to know here? What's gonna help us here in the United States? And what we can do is we can look at the most updated information. So I just updated this this afternoon. Um, the New York Times actually has been really good with providing some great graphics to explain what exactly is happening. So to date, there's been 18 people, 18 individuals who have been treated outside of West Africa for Ebola. What we know is that in the United States, there's been nine and we've had one death. So the first individuals that came in were, um, I don't remember everyone's name, there was a doctor and an aid worker. They went to Emory. After that, we had a second doctor that went to Omaha. 
There's actually another individual that never made the press and no one knows about. They were an aid worker who was in Sierra Leone and who was infected and they were sent to Emory. Never saw on the news anyone walking out of an ambulance. They remained silent. Um, the press remained silent because that individual wished to remain anonymous. In Dallas, unfortunately, is our first death, and that's Thomas Duncan. And in the process of him receiving his medical care, two nurses were infected. One was sent to the unit in Emory. The second one was sent to the unit at the NIH in Bethesda. And the last one was actually released this afternoon as a bullet freight. And then we have the physician in New York City within the past week that was actually admitted. So if you look at all of these individuals in the United States, we've had a pretty good health record with one unfortunate death. And I'm going to talk a, a little bit about one of the things that contributed to Mr. Duncan, um, Mr. Duncan's passing. So the question that everybody wants to know, including my own mom, who called me and asked me, do I need to worry about Ebola? So am I or my family at risk of getting infected for Ebola? And that's what everyone needs to understand. And the answer is, is that the only way for you to become infected is that you absolutely have to have exposure to infected body fluids, which means you need to be in direct, close, personal contact with someone who is already infected. You have to be able to be exposed to a body fluid that has virus in it, and that virus needs to be able to get into your cut. If you have a cut, it can enter into your eyes, it can enter into your nose, or it can enter into your mouth, which are your mucous membranes. A person is not contagious until they are actually showing signs and symptoms of infection. And the first symptom is fever. And even at that point in time, when an individual first has a fever, there are many individuals that their virus number in their blood is so low that it's still difficult to detect by clinical testing methods. So what are body fluids? We have lots of body fluids, blood, semen, breast milk, vomit, feces, urine, tears, saliva, and sweat. Probably a lot of things you really don't want to think about. But when we look at someone who has acute phase illness, so someone who's just showing signs and symptoms, fever, and they're progressing as their fever is getting higher, where can I find virus? Is it everywhere? And Studies have shown from past outbreaks that the virus is primarily found in blood, in saliva, in breast milk, in feces, tears, and semen only. And even though it's been found in semen, there is no, um, there is no case of Ebola being sexually transmitted. So even though it's detected, we haven't had a documented case of sexual transmission of this particular organism. So what are our patient symptoms? And I'm going to touch on them briefly. Our nursing faculty are going to go over them more. But what we know is that magic 21 days that we keep hearing in the news. What is so special about 21 days? After someone has been exposed, usually on average, about 8 to 10 days, they start to show symptoms. That first symptom is going to be fever. There is documentation in the literature that some people show symptoms as soon as 2 days. We go all the way out to 21 days for the first symptoms. Very little literature after 21 days. Most people are going to be showing infection by then. We know virus is only detectable in the blood after the presence of fever, and we are testing for virus RNA. So I said the virus was a single-stranded RNA, it's a negative sense organism, and we use a molecular method, so we're testing for virus nucleic acid, virus specific nucleic acid, something that we would never have, and we need to make sure that the person has a fever first before we test that, because a lot of the times it's going to be negative. What's our fever cutoff? 100.3. And we're also looking for an individual who has a headache, who is vomiting. Believe it or not, diarrhea is one of the biggest symptoms of Ebola and abdominal pain due to hemorrhaging. And usually it's bleeding in the intestine. Um, and those are the, the findings that you're going to first detect with an individual who's been exposed. What's the most important information on transmission? Another big question. This is not an airborne virus. You have to have direct contact with infected body fluids. It's actually very difficult to become infected. It's not as easy as people think. There's lots of literature following um, outbreaks, previous outbreaks, where house members, so individuals who have lived in the house with someone who has an active Ebola infection, and the only member of the household who actually gets infected is the person who has physical contact with the infected individual. So this is someone who's bathing, who is helping um, an individual eat, who is cleaning up diarrhea. Those are the individuals who become infected themselves. 
All other house members, if you do not have physical contact with the infected person, do not come down with infection. So we actually find that here in the United States. So two things to consider in this outbreak that I think we don't hear a lot in the news. So Thomas Duncan, the individual in Dallas who succumbed to his infection, traveled from Liberia. He was very ill when he was finally admitted to the hospital in Dallas. He actually lived with his fiance and an eight-year-old child. Neither one of those individuals are infected. They have been released from their 21-day quarantine and they are virus-free. So they are not at risk to pass infection because they were never exposed. The other individual that we haven't heard anything about really is an airline traveler that was traveling from Liberia to Nigeria. So there was an outbreak in Nigeria with this organism that was very quickly contained. This individual flew from Liberia to Nigeria, had active Ebola disease. He passed out in the airport. He succumbed to the virus in the airport. They brought him to the hospital where he was treated and he died of his infection. However, every single person on that plane with him, when this individual had signs and symptoms of infection, are virus free. You cannot spread this from being in the same room with someone. Are there viruses that you can get on an airplane? Absolutely. How many people know that you can get measles on an airplane? There are 23 cases in the literature of someone who flew. So someone on a plane had measles and there were other people on the plane who were not vaccinated against measles and they got it just from being in an airplane with an individual. So that's an airborne organism. The outbreak of SARS that was in around 2003, anybody who was on the same floor of a hotel with that individual, it's just in the air, you're passing this individual in the hallway, that's enough to get an airborne organism. That is absolutely not the case for this organism, and that's something to definitely remember. So, does our virus survive outside the body? And this is one of the things that people are concerned about. Well, if I take the subway, and Dr. Spencer took the subway, do I need to worry about getting this organism? And the answer is, the chance of you getting it unless he bled um, on a subway handle and you're touching it right after is zero. The virus, if in body fluids, can survive. So we know pure virus on a tabletop or a countertop can only survive for several hours. The, CDD, the CDC performed several studies um, that were at a very controlled room temperature and a very controlled um, room humidity and they looked for virus survival. And what they found is those viruses would only last for a few hours. If body fluids are outside of the body that have been infected with Ebola, will they survive? And it depends for several days to several weeks. Again, these are very controlled experiments. If blood with Ebola is at room temperature, it can survive for several days. If blood contaminated with Ebola is in the fridge, it can survive for several weeks. And this has been rigorous um, um, conducted experiments to determine is this possible. What we do know and what has been done is that um, after one of the outbreaks in Africa, a study was done and they looked at the Ebola isolation ward. And in the Ebola isolation ward, they cultured 31 different surfaces. So this is an area that all they have is Ebola infected patients. And they went back and looked and they found virus nowhere except for one bloody glove. So the organism can't live on countertops. It can't live on bench tops. What we can do very easily to kill it is household bleach. So um, for our science people, one to 10 dilution, my students should be able to tell me how to make that. Um, one, what's a one to 10 dilution? One cup bleach and nine cups water. Make that, put it on top of blood that has Ebola and let it sit for 10 minutes and the, organ, the organism has been eliminated. You can use alcohol-based products. So your hand, your Purell, which is 70% alcohol, that's all you need to eliminate infection. And then if you don't have alcohol and you don't have bleach, um, good old household vinegar, 3% solution will also eliminate your organism. So when it comes to different viral infections, this is actually fairly easy to kill and does not last that long in the environment. So how do we treat infection? There are several things that were in the literature, some things that were in the news. I'm gonna touch on the supportive care. My nursing faculty uh, colleagues will touch on that. So one of the reasons why individuals who have come to the United States have done so well is that we have access to IV fluids. They can get blood products, they can get plasma, and we can give them medications to support their drop in blood pressure due to potential hemorrhaging. One of the other well-established treatments that we actually find that was given here and that we also hear about as a, um, a treatment in the African countries when there's an outbreak is what um, we call a blood transfusion. 
So what we're doing is we're actually not taking the cells from someone who has previously been infected, but we're taking their serum. So our blood cells circulate in a fluid. We're taking that fluid from an individual who has already survived Ebola. That fluid actually has something that we call antibodies, and that protects us against infection. And we're gonna take that serum, that fluid, and we're gonna give it to somebody who is a compatible blood match, so we still need to make sure that they're the same or a similar blood type that they can tolerate this transfusion, and that is enough to help people um, survive infection. One of the unfortunate things about Mr. Duncan in Dallas is that there was not a compatible blood type for him to receive serum from those individuals in the United States that had already survived infection. And it was felt that that was one of the reasons why he had succumbed to infection. So there are several experimental treatments, and one of them got a lot of billing, and it's called ZMAP. So if you want to know who makes it, ZMAP is actually made by a small um, biopharmaceutical company called MAP Biopharmaceuticals. And what they're doing, so they're, they're taking advantage of the fact that we know antibodies can protect against Ebola infection. So here is um, our Ebola virus with little spiky things on the surface. And our antibodies look like a Y. So the bottom allows us to bind to our own cells of our immune system. The top part of the Y is what binds to that pathogen that's infecting us and helps us to eliminate it. So this company in particular actually developed antibodies to treat a person. And what they did is they took mice, they infect the mice with Ebola, and the mice produce their own antibodies. Through a rather complicated protocol, they were able to isolate out um, those um, antibodies in the cells that produce them, and they took that material and they humanized them. So what they did is they actually turned a mouse antibody into a human antibody, and they made some of it in the lab. So as you can imagine, it's not an easy process. And in order to make these humanized mouse antibodies, you have to try to grow them. And they used plant matter, and it takes a while to do. But they exhausted their um, supply of ZMAP, this antibody, but it seems to have provided protection. And it basically what it's doing is the same exact thing as our own antibodies for someone who survived infection. So it provides protection. And then the last drug that's been used um, in, for several patients, it's um, activity um, at this point in time is still questionable, is brincidofovir, which is an antiviral. So we take antibiotics when we have a bacterial bronchitis. We have antivirals that are targeted specifically to virus agents. And this antiviral was targeted towards DNA viruses. And even though Ebola is an RNA virus, we're still they're still finding some method of protection. So that's been an option. So how do we prevent future infection? And usually we can say, well, if it comes to some of the poorer countries, um, some of the developing countries, it would be um, increasing healthcare infrastructure, which is a huge undertaking. One of the things that we can do that can benefit people all across the world is we can develop vaccines. And when it comes to Ebola and vaccines, the FDA for the United States currently doesn't have any approved vaccine for public use. We know worldwide there isn't an approved vaccine at this point in time. What we do know in the literature are two vaccines, one developed by a United States scientist and one developed by a Canadian and a United States scientist. And that particular candidate is very promising. It was developed over 10 years ago. And what they were able to show is that if you took primates, so non-human primates, um, apes, chimpanzees, you vaccinated them with the vaccine they created, they were 100% protected against Ebola infection. And there was a lot of promise and it was thought that this vaccine would move forward. But in order to move a vaccine forward, you need someone who's willing to sponsor. And at that point in time, there was no pharmaceutical support. Um, to give you an idea, to go from the research lab to actually getting an injection into your arm can take anywhere from 10 to 20 years, and the price tag is anywhere from $500 million to a $1 billion. So pharmaceutical companies have a huge undertaking, and they need to make a profit. So some vaccines don't necessarily fall into that category. So this particular vaccine, which was very promising, with no pharmaceutical support, the Canadian gov government decided to patent this vaccine, and they made a 1,000 vials, and it's been sitting in the storage. What they have recently done is they have donated all of these vials to the WHO, and the WHO is currently in phase one clinical trials, and this is their vaccine. And the vaccine actually targets those little spiky um, um, things on the top of your Ebola virus, and it's a glycoprotein is what it's going after. 
and they've started phase one trials, which they're looking at for patient safety. The really interesting thing about this vaccine is that there is evidence that even if you've been exposed and you're actively infected with Ebola, it still provides some protection. So there's a lot of thought that it can actually be um, given as a prophylactic, which is usually not what we think about for vaccines. Um, so my last slide before I turn it over to my nursing colleagues. What is the U.S. doing to make sure this won't spread? And this has actually been really controversial. Um, this morning on the Today Show, I watched Chris Christie talk about quarantining people. Um, and the interesting thing, and a lot of people probably don't realize, is the government actually has the ability to quarantine you, um, and it's um, perfectly legal. Uh, so following protocol is really important. So when it comes to making sure that this uh, virus won't spread in the United States, we have policies in place in regards to Liberia, Guinea, and Sierra Leone, which is where our biggest um, numbers are. There are level three travel restrictions that have been initiated by the CDC. So what does that mean? It says non-essential travel is strongly discouraged. So if you were gonna go sightseeing in one of these countries, it's suggested that you actually don't visit at all. The United States has changed entry. So if you've visited any one of these countries and you're on your way back to the US, you now have to pass through only one of five airports, which are all listed here. And then travelers from problematic countries are subjected to particular criteria. You can either be no risk, low risk, or high risk exposure. So individuals who were just in Liberia, who never came across an individual who was diagnosed with EBV, or had any signs and symptoms are gonna be considered no risk. They are to monitor themselves for 21 days, and that means they're supposed to be taking their temperature twice a day for 21 days, reporting to the public health authority, and they have unrestricted movement. So they don't, they're not quarantined, they don't need to stay home. Low risk is an individual who may have been exposed, and this is where our healthcare workers fall. So if they have no signs and symptoms, they're asymptomatic, they're considered conditional release and controlled movement, and they need to monitor for 21 days their temperature. High risk is someone that more than likely you've been exposed and you need to be um, conditional release controlled movement. So what does that mean, conditional release and controlled movement? The authorities have let you go home, and they're asking you to stay home, to stay off public transportation, not to go in a supermarket and go food shopping, Stay home for 21 days and monitor and make sure that you're fine. And if any hint of signs and symptoms, you need to call the authorities. And um, practices are put into place to be able to follow through and to make sure that you don't expose under indi other individuals. So as I said, federal law allows government to enforce quarantine if needed. Um, the NBC camera crew, so Ashukta Mukta, who went to Omaha, was a part of an NBC camera crew. And he was diagnosed with Ebola. All of his crewmates, including some of the reporters for NBC, were to self-quarantine. So they were supposed to stay home and monitor temperature for 21 days. Individuals in that group decided not to follow quarantine. The government enforced quarantine after that. In the United States Constitution, it's actually written, and the CDC enforces it, that if it is felt there is a public health emergency or crisis that could result because you were potentially infected with an organism, they actually can enforce self-quarantine, and that's what people are not happy about. Um, my last note, and this changes, um, it's changed since yesterday. Um, I haven't seen anything else Chris Christie has said this afternoon, so it may have changed again. There are a lot of states that are concerned, and as healthcare workers come back, people are frightened of becoming exposed, and I've just basically told you the risk of becoming exposed. But what I can tell you um, is that Doctors Without Borders has had over 700 medical personnel, RNs and physicians, in the Ebola outbreak area in Western Africa. And out of those 700 individuals to date, only three have become infected. So there is a low risk if healthcare workers are practicing um, good um, PPE with a partner and following protocols. Do accidents happen? Um, accidents happen everywhere. And proper training is hopefully will eliminate that. Okay, so at this point in time, I'm gonna turn it over to my colleague, Diane Rodolfi, and she's gonna talk to you uh, more about um, patient care and hospital conditions. Thank you, Dr. Perrin, that was excellent. So um, before I start my talk, I just wanna say that my heart really goes out to the people in West Africa who've been hardest hit by the Ebola virus 
And um, I don't think anybody here can really understand the conditions and what these people are going through. <clears throat> so what my talk is going to be about, um, I'm going to tell you a little bit about a nur nursing perspective. And, um, and so we'll just move on from here we go. So transmission, Dr. Perrin already talked about. The Ebola virus spreads through human-to-human -human transmission through direct body contact. Again, um, this is just rehashing what she's already said. Body fluids include blood, sweat, vomit, feces, urine. And um, with regard to what kills Ebola, again, this is kind of a rehash of what Dr. Parents already said. Um, any disinfectant used to um, used for common non-envelope viruses, and an example of these viruses would be the norovirus, the rotavirus, adenovirus, or poliovirus. So when you look in your in your cabinet at what household cleaners you have, you might be surprised at what you come up with. And the, the facts that Dr. Parent and I were talking about last week is that it turns out that Clorox wipes really don't have any Clorox in them. Um, Comet with bleach, which has been one of my old favorites for 50 years, really doesn't have a considerable amount of bleach in it. So you really have to kind of look at your products. And just for the academic types here, the bad news is a lot of these products don't work, but the good news is we can go back to the basics. And the basics are basic hand washing, a little bit of bleach, one to 10 dilution, and your uh, hand sanitizer. So that's the good news. It's cheap, it's easy, and it works. Okay, so who takes care of these patients? It's a very multidisciplinary team. It involves ev almost every aspect of um, the hospitals and departments within every facility. Uh, as far as the medical staff goes, it includes doctors that specialize in infectious disease. It includes intensive care unit, internists, nephrologists, since many, some of these patients actually go into multi-organ failure, so renal issues are a problem. Anesthesia is important because sometimes these patients need to be intubated. As far as the nursing staff goes, uh, all of the nurses for the most part are ICU trained. So it includes intensive care unit nurses, operating room nurses, emergency room department nurses, as well as pediatrics. Also included in the team, nutrition, laboratory sciences, environmental management, facilities, security, and media relations. So one of the things that, that Emory and Nebraska have taught us, and I think all the hospitals are starting to um, talk about is, and it's common sense, you want to have as few people going in and interacting with the patients when they come into the hospital. So for the most part, nursing takes over a lot more responsibilities. So your nurses would do the phlebotomy, nurses do blood cultures, the nurses run the dialysis machines, they are in charge of the ventilators, physical therapy, they do the nurse tech jobs. And then environmental sciences also, if there are um, contaminated spills in the room, the nurses would clean that up. And also they do the unit clerk type jobs. So big responsibility falls on to nursing. So there's been a big media swirl um, and a lot of political swirl around Ebola. And um, we've already heard the story about Mr. Duncan and uh, he came to Dallas uh, Presbyterian. He w went to the emergency room. He was sent home. Upon his second admission, they diagnosed him with Ebola. And on October 8th, he passed away. And what happened after that was on October 12th, Nina Pham, who was the intensive care unit nurse who admitted him, was diagnosed with Ebola. And um, she was isolated. And on October 12th, her dog Bentley was also isolated. He was isolated for 21 days. Not long after that, on October 15th, um, uh, Amber Vincent was also diagnosed with Ebola. So what actually happened in Dallas uh, has not been fully understood. But what we do know is that Dallas originally had two different protocols that they used as far as protecting themselves. The initial, one of the initial protocols involved putting on the PPE, the personal protective equipment, and <clears throat> the um, necks of the nurses and physicians were exposed somewhat. So it's possible that that had something to do with it, but again, that's not been totally proven. So October 15th, Amber Vincent was diagnosed, and on October 16th, President Obama made a statement 
And what he said was, what remains true is that this is not an airborne disease and it's not easy to catch. Prior to that, statements had been made that any hospital in the United States could take care of these patients because they're basically droplet and contact precautions. So if you're sitting next to anybody who is big on conspiracy theory, you can start to make a lot of different ideas. You start talking, you Google, is it really not airborne? So um, just to dispel the elephant in the room, Let's talk a little bit about what's probably scaring you. So when you hear that it's not easy to catch, when you hear it's not airborne, isn't it this that really is upsetting you? So can I have a show of hands? Is this what's scary? Like, how, how is this not airborne when I see them wearing this? And you walk by every television, you walk by every newspaper, and you see these people dressed to the hilt in their spacesuits. I mean, that's just, it doesn't make sense, does it? So let's take a deep breath and let's talk about this a little bit. So what do we really know? And what we really do know, even if you are not the trusting type, what you, we really do know is that when Mr. Duncan came to the United States, he was in an airport, he was at home with his family. He was quite sick when he came for the second time to the emergency room. And none of his family got Ebola, did they? And then you look at Nina Pham. She was young. I think she had a boyfriend. They didn't talk about him. They talked about the dog more. But <laughs> Nina Pham's family and friends didn't get Ebola. The dog didn't get Ebola. They pulled him out in a suit. He was scared to death. <laughs> but he didn't get Ebola. He might be a bleach blonde right now. You get it, bleach blonde. <laughs> but he's, um, he, you know, it, no Ebola. And then we go to Amber Vincent. She was engaged to be married. She was in the, you know, getting her wedding dress fitted. They were probably hugging her and touching her. Nobody got Ebola. Both Duncan and Amber Vincent were both in airports. They were both on airplanes. Nobody got Ebola. So that's what we know even if you're not a trusting type. What we do know is Ebola's been around a long time, so we do know it's not airborne. Okay, so now you're looking at me and you're looking at Dr. Parent and we're still telling you it's not easy to catch. We're still telling you don't worry, don't worry. So what you're still worried about is I still have this picture up here and I'm not explaining how, why they're wearing this and I'm not supposed to wear anything. Well, what I need to do is be a little graphic, I think, to explain the next step. And that is when these patients do get sick, they get very sick. And I'm going to give you a little window into what happens once they enter into the hospital. According to many reports from both the doctor that had Ebola as well as Mr. Duncan, when you hear the nurses who are interviewed, what is really apparent, these patients have diarrhea, explosive diarrhea. There's blood in their diarrhea. They have projectile vomiting. There's blood in their vomit. They lose so much fluid that they need to, be they need to have massive fluid um, given to them just to maintain their blood pressures. One of the nurses taking care of Mr. Duncan, and I'm going to be very graphic, described when, he, when they got him up to go to the bathroom, he had explosive diarrhea all over the wall, over all the floor. So there are a lot of contaminated wastes with these patients. And that's the reason we're geared up this way. Okay. So I think that answers that question pretty well. Was, that pretty, was it graphic enough for you? Okay, good. So. Um, so we are erring on, we take the extra steps, so we're erring on the, on the side of caution, okay? So that's why we're geared up this way. The Centers for Disease Con Control. We, we as nurses really look to the CDC. We trust them, we put all our faith in them. Whenever we have a question, we go to their website. And honestly, um, I'm gonna say something controversial maybe, but I think it's fair to say the CDC was slow to respond. We as nurses wanted some information. We needed information. It takes us a long time to put policies, procedures in place to protect everybody. So the CDC was slow in responding. So when we take care of a patient who's strictly on contact and droplet precautions, this is what, this is what we do in the hospital. So contact precautions is basically, um, an example would be MRSA. Everybody's heard about MRSA in the environment. Basically in the hospital what we do is we put on a gown and gloves. That's it. We don't double glove, gown and gloves. When we step it up to droplet precaution, an example of that would be the flu. Uh, what we do is we put on a gown, gloves, mask, 
No special mask. We do have airborne masks. We don't wear airborne masks for patients who wear flu on droplet precautions. So these are the things we usually do as nurses when we're taking care of somebody who has, is on contact and droplet precautions. And this is an, a picture of the Emory doctor and, and how um, he, he um, is what he's wearing. He's wearing coveralls, double gloving, booties, apron, and a paper hood, which is actually like a respirator. So right after uh, Amber Vinson was diagnosed, the um, American uh, Nurses Association President Pam Cipriani made a statement, and I think she said it really well. She said, we look to the CDC to be really vigilant, to be transparent in sharing their findings, and hopefully upgrading or clarifying any additional requirements that are necessary. And I think that was really well, well put. So across the United States, I think who came to the forefront with this Ebola virus, we do have leading um, biocontainment units. And um, Emory in Nebraska, I think, if you watched any of the news, you saw their names plastered across all of the media footage. And um, on October 20th, the CDC adapted a lot of what Emory and Nebraska were saying. And you'll see policies, procedures on the CDC site. Emory's policy and procedure book, which is 84 pages long, is posted now in the CDC, which is, which is excellent. So key concepts that we want to look at when we're talking about Ebola, first, the first thing we want to do is identify. We need to do early identification. That protects the public. It protects our healthcare workers. And it actually protects the patient, obviously, because the sooner we treat them, the better our outcome is. The second thing we do is isolate. These patients go into a negative pressure room. And this picture is actually from the negative pressure room or isolation room, I think, in Emory. And then we also um, protect. We use the correct uh, protective gear, the correct PPE. And then finally, um, caring for the patient, which I'm not going to talk too much about because that's Jessica's piece. I don't want to touch on her stuff. So key concepts that we learned from both Emory and Nebraska First, again, early detection is, very, is really key. Safety for the patient, safety for the workers. Uh, both Emory and Nebraska had dedicated staff who took care of these patients. Education is key. Nurses do not normally walk around with this kind of personal protective equipment. Education's key. Training and competency-based checklists are used, just like in our nursing sim lab. You have to test out or you don't get to take care of the patient. Also, all the nurses and healthcare providers were required to do refresher courses. This was taken very, very seriously. And communication was key also because you always had, you have patients on the inside who are scared that there's an Ebola patient down the hall. You have media on the outside. You have healthcare workers that are afraid to take care of these patients. So communication is very important <coughs> also. So more that came out of Emory, Nebraska. They had dedicated staff in full gear. They did double glove. They duct taped their gloves to their gowns so that there would be no skin that would um, potentially um, uh, be exposed. They wore Crocs. I'm not sure if Crocs are going to be more popular now that Emory and Nebraska wear it, but they wore Crocs. And when they stepped out of the isolation room, they stepped into a bucket of bleach to decontaminate their boots. They limited the sharps and aerosolized treatments, so this would not be the day that you would have your dental hygienist cleaning their teeth. Um, and then the buddy system, very, very important. We had, what they did was they had a buddy system in place where the buddy was also in full gear and the buddy assisted in putting on the equipment, also removing the PPE equipment. And another really, really important thing was the buddy was also an observer. The buddy took pro takes pride in calling out breaks in technique. So they took pride in that, and they were quick to say, hey, uh, I don't think so. You got alcohol down or bleach down on that one. So they also monitored healthcare workers for 21 days. So finally, my last slide is about waste removal, a little bit more about diarrhea, right? So um, Emory and Nebraska both, uh, one of the things you don't think about, a lot, most of the equipment we use or they used um, what's disposable. What do you do with all the garbage? What do you do with all the waste? What Emory and Nebraska both did was they actually put their garbage in autoclaves. Once the stuff was autoclaved, then they would dispose of it. What do you do with all the diarrhea stool, the vomit? What do you do with that? Well, Emory had an interesting comment um, 
on one of their conference calls. And what, hap what happened was the water management in their city said, if you flush that Ebola stool down the toilet, we will turn off your water. So they got around that by, they dumped bleach into the toilet, they left it in for more than five minutes, and then they flushed. So that's how they handled that. So on that note, I'm gonna hand this over to Jessica Mataraka. Hello. So I'm gonna talk about the treatment of Ebola from a nursing aspect. It's gonna be very basic, so hopefully. So symptoms, which we already talked about, the first sign is the abrupt onset of fever. These usually come on pretty immediately. Um, it's usually eight to 12 days after exposure. Um, may be confused with other diseases, which may become a problem. You have to make sure you rule out malaria, other bacterial infections like pneumonia, even the flu, which we all get the, a fever with the flu, so we might see an increased exposure in the hospital with that. After five days, they may progress to develop uh, gastrointestinal symptoms, severe, more diarrhea, love talking about diarrhea, <laughs> nausea, vomiting, and abdominal pain. The one nurse that cared for um, Duncan in Dallas said, in his 20 years of nursing, he's never seen the amount of diarrhea that he witnessed with Duncan. So I don't, if you've ever been in healthcare, we all take care of that and we understand. So other symptoms, you may see a rash, which would be hemorrhagic. Um, bleeding, like they said, only 18% of the cases have been reported have have bleeding, which is usually blood in the stool or vomit or under the skin. Bleeding is not what kills these patients, however. Um, it's when the blood starts to leak out of the vessels that cause your blood pressure to drop and then leads to organ failure. So that's multi-system organ failure and septic shock, seizures. With the overwhelming immune response, it attacks all organs, so you never know what organ may fail. You can see the course of when the symptoms occur, of course, headache, fever, fatigue are also the most common reported symptoms. Even patients that have recovered still are reporting fatigue, muscle weakness, joint pain, and this is almost six weeks out from having their initial um, Ebola. So treatment, early supportive care is key. Why do they need to be in the intensive care unit, you're thinking? If they just have some nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, that's not what you typically see. But you need to make sure you're managing these patients on a day-by-day -day basis. They're gonna need specialized healthcare team, which Diane um, talked about. I know that in Christiana, there's training people, so if somebody comes into the emergency department, a specialized group of people will be dedicated to care for you. Um, and you just wanna make sure you ch respond to the rapidly changing conditions. So what are the key treatments? Intravenous fluids, balancing their electrolytes, avoiding complications from shock or multi-system organ failure, and also, as Dr. Parent talked about, the transfusion of blood plasma from an Ebola survivor so that the antibodies get into their system. So intravenous fluids. You wanna prevent dehydration from the explosive diarrhea and projectile vomiting. Uh, you wanna make sure the early correction of the volume death deficit is essential to ensure the adequate tissue perfusion so that you prevent the multi-organ system failure. These patients may also need an additional five to 10 liters of fluids per day due to third spacing. So if you think of a two liter Coke bottle, times that by four or five, that's what these people need. Now third spacing, I know I'm getting into the nursing terms, is when um, fluid moves from your intervascular spaces, which means your blood vessels, to the interstitial space, which is the non-function area between cells. So these patients develop a severe edema, which is swelling of your extremities. They may have decreased cardiac output or heart function, which may lead them to go into fluid overload, which can cause respiratory complications and hypotension. So electrolyte imbalance, which is due to the severe GI illness the patient may have. These may be deficit in potassium, magnesium, sodium, or calcium. This is also important for the intensive care unit because you want to replete them as necessary with oral and IV medications. So they may be getting these every one to two hours, depending on the severity of their GI. Um, imbalances can often lead to cardiac arrhythmias. So you want to make sure that they're on the heart monitor, you're monitoring their vital signs monitoring vital signs. You want to monitor their blood pressure, urinary output, and respiratory status. Like I said, it affects all organs, so you also want to look at their mental status, liver functions. You're going to be doing lab work consistently. Um, you want to infuse fluid as long as their blood pressure remains low. What that means is a systolic blood pressure of less than 90 or a mean arterial pressure of less than 65. 
that's all the nursing, you know, that's nursing terms. Prolonged periods of low blood pressure can lead to poor perfusion of the organs, and which cause irreversible damage. Late symptoms, this is when we get into Mr. Duncan's case, um, is organ failure or septic shock. Like I said, these patients do not die from bleeding. It's more from when their organs start to fail. And we believe with the Duncan, he wasn't treated, the Duncan, sorry, Mr. Duncan, that he wasn't treated for almost four days after he started showing signs and symptoms. So he was probably already having problems from um, being volume depleted. So you wanna do either a breathing tube or intubation for oxygenation. Like I said, if you're pumping all that fluid into the patient, they may be at risk for developing breathing issues due to fluid overload. You also are gonna have blood pressure medications for low blood pressure. These will all be infused through invasive monitoring, which includes central lines. You're gonna be looking at central venous pressures, a lot of technical terms. Um, you're gonna do antibodies for other infections that may have developed. Some of these patients may require dialysis because when you become hypotensive, you have poor perfusion to your kidneys, which is gonna cause acute renal failure. Some patients are okay with just fluids, but other may need dialysis to help them through. Um, blood products, depending on what your liver function is doing, some people may develop acute liver failure, which will lead to increased bleeding, so you may need to give them whole blood, may need to give them plasma, other clotting factors. So some of the statistics, nine patients have been treated in the United States, eight out of nine have survived. In Liberia, Sierra Leone, and Guinea, 70% mortality is reported. So why is there such a difference between West Africa and the United States? No one's really sure, as some Dr. Parent has said as well, but some think it's due to early preventative care, um, that we have a medical medical treatment centers, that we're diagnosing them more rapidly. Others also believe that we have better immune systems but we're not really sure why we're going so well. Um, but like I said, Duncan, he was, did not receive treatment, so we're thinking that's why his condition deteriorated. But he also waxed and waned. Some days he was doing really well, other days he wasn't, so he was an interesting case. But like I said, early diagnosis and medical interventions may make a difference, and all except for the mystery person, these are all the survivors so far. Um, Nina Pham, Dr. Spencer is the one that's in the middle who's still in New York. He's just now entering the GI phase of the illness, but he's still listed as stable condition. And then Dr. Brantley, um, Amber Vincent, I don't know how to pronounce the other gentleman's name, and Rick uh, Sarka, which I was brief. But, oh, thank you for your attention.